CR101radio.com, podcasts, and more. Good morning. Our scripture text this morning will be from the book of James in the New Testament. <clears throat> book of James, chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James three thirteen through 18, concerning wisdom from above. James three thirteen through 18. This is God's word. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And there we'll read, we'll end the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we do pray that you'll bless us as we Receive this word this morning. Pray that you will help us to receive it into our hearts and to do what this text says, to show it by our works. Pray that you will make us wise according to the wisdom that comes from you and to reject the wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. One of the things that wisdom means in the Bible is really having the ability or the skill to apply God's word to your life and to do it. Fools trust in their own minds, but wise people trust in God's word. They know how to take God's word, read it, understand it, and skillfully apply it to the situations of their life, to live in a way that's godly, living a way that's pleasing to the Lord. All right, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Right? You don't trust in your own mind. You trust in the Lord and his word. So let me just state the obvious. Having the ability to apply God's word to your life is essential to obeying God. If you can't apply God's word to your life, you aren't going to be able to obey his law, his commandments. Right? It's pretty obvious. If you don't know how to obey him, you won't obey him. You have to know how to have the wisdom, the skill, the ability to apply his word to your life so you can do it, so you can obey him. Wisdom from God, then, is essential to Christian living, right? Something that affects your entire walk with the Lord. But yet, I fear that so many of us as Christians don't really put the effort in to try to get wise. We don't put the effort in to seek out wisdom from God's word so that we can be more godly, so we can be more obedient, we want to increase in wisdom so we can increase in righteousness in our life. It's, in, it's increasing in our sanctification when we get wiser. Uh, Greg Bonson wrote a little paper on, um, he called it a moral checkup for your mouth. It's a lot of scriptures about speaking in a godly way. But he said this in the introduction. I think it's helpful because it's kind of obvious and simple, but it's, it's something we need to hear. He says, it's every Christian's heartfelt desire to live a more holy life. One that better glorifies God and displays his love, right? The process by which believers grow in holiness is called sanctification. It's the result of God's powerful, transforming grace within us. Now, I'm sure we know all this, right? I'm sure we understand this. But listen to this. This is a really important, simple statement. He says, The outworking of the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work is not as vague or mystical as many well-meaning Christians imagine. It can be seen very def- in very definite ways in our conduct. So sanctification is not, not something that's kind of like, well, am I sanctified? How can I know? It's some sort of mystical, invisible thing, kind of vague. He says, no, you can see it very plainly in the way you live your life, in your conduct. If you want to be more sanctified, you want to grow in obedience to the Lord, that's going to show in the way you live your life. And this text before us is going to say, you have to have godly wisdom to have a godly life. You need to desire that godly wisdom. So the question is, are you wise? 
Do you have wisdom from above, wisdom from God, residing in your heart and working out in your life? And the question is, how do you know? How do you know you have real wisdom and not a false sort of wisdom that's actually foolishness? And that's what this passage in James deals with this morning. So let's look at at the text. Look at James 3.13. The first point this morning is that wisdom is shown by works. James 3.13. He says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. He says, who among you is wise and understanding? A rhetorical question, one that you should not answer too quickly. If you're already saying, yeah, I'm wise, slow down, slow down. Many think that they're wise and mature, right? We kind of have a natural tendency. I'm not a fool. I know what I'm doing, right? I'm wise. The questions we need to ask, though, is do you follow God's word in your life? Do you follow the ways of God? And again, those questions should not be answered too quickly either. Too quickly either because when you, when you speak broadly and generally, do you obey the Lord? Yeah, I want to obey the Lord. But when, what about when you get to the particulars? What about the particular things that God's word says? It's very easy to say, yes, I follow the ways of God. <clears throat> but wisdom is shown by the way you live your life, including your words and your actions. Whether or not you're wise and understanding, he says, who is wise and understanding? He said, that will be shown by not you claiming to be wise, but by your deeds. It will be shown by how you live your life. He says, let him show it by his deeds, by exhibiting your wisdom and the way you apply God's words to your life, and the way that you live, the way you act, what you do, and really what you say <clears throat> as well. James has already urged us in his letter not simply to be hearers of the word, right, but to be doers as well. <clears throat> James chapter 1, 22 and following, he says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. All right? Not somebody who says, yeah, yeah, I know the word, so I'm godly. He says, no, don't delude yourself. Are you a doer as well? Do you actually do it? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not, be, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So what's he, what's he saying? What's his illustration? <clears throat> if you're a hearer only and not a doer of the law, you're like somebody who looks in the mirror and sees himself. And you see all sorts of dirt and all sorts of ugly stuff going on there. And you walk away and you don't do anything about it. It doesn't affect you at all. You see it, you walk away, forget about it. You're not changed. You look at the, you look at the word of God. It says all this stuff about you, all this ugliness that's in you. And you walk away from it and you forget about it. You come to church, you hear the sermon, you say, yeah, okay. And then you leave and nothing changes. You don't do anything about it. You're a hearer only, but not a doer. The word doesn't stick. It doesn't get into you and affect change in you. Your life doesn't look any different. You've heard it. It gets into your brain, but... Nothing changes. That's somebody who is a a hearer only and not a doer. And he says, don't be that way. And he says that in our text as well. He's saying good behavior is the fruit of wisdom. He says, let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So if you're going to say, yes, I have wisdom and I have understanding, you don't just say it. You do it. You show it by your deeds. Now, he he uses that phrase, not simply just your deeds, but your deeds done in the gentleness of wisdom. It's really interesting that he says that. Gentleness. Somebody who's characterized not by harshness. Somebody who is <clears throat> meek and mild and gentle. They have a gentle attitude in their behavior and their words. It also could be, ta- could be seen as humility of wisdom. The gentleness or the humility of wisdom. Both of those words here connote the idea of not being harsh and the way that you treat others and your words and, and your actions. See, wise people are gentle people. They're not harsh. You, you, you behave in a way that, it, that gives this atmosphere of gentleness about you. That's part of being wise. This section here, James 3.13 in, in the text this morning, comes right on the heels of this long section about the tongue, right? You're probably familiar with that section, James 3, on how you use your words and how he says a lot of really serious and severe stuff about your, your tongue. Your tongue is set on fire by hell and it curses men but blesses God. And there's all this inconsistency and wickedness that comes from the tongue. So he says, right after all that, he says this, show your wisdom by your gentleness, by the gentleness 
of wisdom. And that certainly applies to the way that we speak. Wisdom dictates how we're going to live and how we're going to speak. And we're going to have to live and speak in a way that's characterized by gentleness, not severity and harshness. If we're going to speak to others, we're going to speak about others, we have to do it with gentleness that God's wisdom instructs us to have. He says, do it in the gentleness of wisdom. That's really a characteristic of wisdom, and we'll see that again repeated. True wisdom here in this text is going to be contrasted with the false wisdom. We'll look at this in a minute. You have wisdom from God, and you have wisdom that is not from God, but is from below, that is earthly in character. But the wisdom from God here is gentle, he says. And we want to show that by our work. So that's the first point this morning. Secondly, look at 14 through 16. Our second point this morning is this ungodly wisdom, which is earthly, natural, and demonic. Look at verse 14. He says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. The thing about wisdom is he talks about two types of wisdom here. Godly wisdom and then this false kind of wisdom. And the thing about them is they, they both prove themselves by their fruit, by their works, by your actions and words. Either it will produce godly actions and words or this false sort of earthly wisdom will produce ungodly actions and words. This wisdom that he describes here, he says, it's not from above, it's not from God, it's not a godly wisdom, but he says it's a wisdom that's earthly, or that's from the earth, right? It's something that is not from above. He says it's natural, or that could be translated unspiritual. It's not from the Holy Spirit, this wisdom he's about to talk about. He says it's demonic, it's not from God, it's from Satan, it's from demons, it's, it's from spirits who are in rebellion against God, not those that are actually according to his word. It's a hard thing. This is the stuff that he's talking about. This is the type of wisdom that people have naturally. It's a earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom. And he says there are two things in particular he emphasizes that will be the works that come out of that false wisdom. And that's jealousy and selfish ambition. He says that twice in verse 14 and also verse 16. Jealousy and selfish ambition are the fruits of this sort of false, ungodly wisdom. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. In verse 16 as well. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So how does somebody know if they have this sort of earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom in their hearts? Well, you know it the same way. You know, the, the godly wisdom, it's by your works, by your fruits. Jealousy and selfish ambition characterize this sort of false, ungodly wisdom that James is telling us about. So we have to understand, what are those things? We need to be able to identify works that are jealous and selfish. We need to know what that is. So let's talk about that. Jealousy. He says in verse 14, he calls it bitter jealousy. In verse 16, he just simply calls it jealousy. Jealousy is this envy, this covetousness, this resentment of other, this bitterness, he says, this hostility towards other, a greedy, resentful longing for something that belongs to another and desiring that that person doesn't have what they have. Proverbs 27.4 says this about envy and about jealousy in this sense. He says, wrath is fierce and anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? See, in in God's mind, he's saying anger, you see, the the, the Proverbs talk about anger frequently. James also talks about anger. It's very negative when it talks about this ungodly anger. It causes all sorts of trouble. It causes you harm. It causes others harm. It causes strife. He says that anger is fierce. Wrath is a flood. But who can stand before jealousy? He's saying jealousy trumps anger here. It's, It's even worse. It's even more destructive than anger, which is saying a lot. Jealousy, this bitter envy and desire to be better than others, will cause more destructive, more destruction than even anger does. And surely anger causes a lot of destruction. That's what jealousy is. And selfish ambition, he says as well, which goes together very naturally with jealousy. It's, it's selfishness, right? Selfishness. To understand selfishness here, Paul uses the same word in Philippians 2 when he's telling them not to be selfish. Help, provide some helpful clarifications. 
Philippians 2, 3, and 4, he says, Do nothing from selfishness. There's that word. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So the opposite of being selfish is counting others more significant than yourself and not looking out only for yourself, but also for others' interests. Selfish ambition is this excessive desiring of what you want without consideration of what others want. It's selfishness, self-centeredness. It's counting yourself more significant than others. It's looking out for your own interests and not the interests of others. So he's saying this ungodly wisdom produces jealousy, this envy, and it produces this selfishness. Let's look at some examples of the evil of jealousy and selfishness that we have in Scripture. In Acts 13, 44 and 45, we have Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel. What happens? It says, the next Sabbath day, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. They come to hear Paul preach. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. So what happens is Paul's preaching, there's tons of people coming to hear him, and the Jews get jealous. That I, he, I want that popularity, right? The unbelieving Jews are, are, are jealous of Paul's popularity, his influence with the people. So what they do? They start contradicting what Paul is saying. They're, they're going against the teaching of God's word. They're blaspheming, doing all sorts of evil things to cause strife and ruckus because they're jealous of Paul getting a crowd. It says when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. What about you? Is the popularity of others a temptation for you to become jealous of them? When you see others getting praise for what they do or who they are or something, do you get jealous? Are you happy for them? Or do you, do you say in your heart, <clears throat> I wish that was me? Or they don't deserve that? If, if so, that's a fruit of this ungodly wisdom. That's that jealousy, that envy, that covetousness. Not, it's not a fruit of the wisdom that comes from God. It's a fruit of this earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom. Another example of jealousy in scripture is King Saul towards David. 1 Samuel 18, 6-9 says, <clears throat> this is after David kills Goliath. It says, it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine, Goliath, that the women came out from all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry for this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. David was viewed as a greater warrior than Saul by the people. And Saul was very displeased with that. He was jealous, envious. And you know the rest of that story, don't you? That sort of jealousy led Saul to a ton, a panoply of different sins, including attempted murder on David's life, hunting him down, all sorts of things. Also, even abuse of his son and things like that because of his jealousy and rage against David. His bitter jealousy led to disorder in every evil thing, just like James tells us it would. Remember the story... Of the two women, when when Solomon gets his wisdom, when he prays for it, and his wisdom is displayed, he 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 is able to arbitrate cases with wisdom. He's able to judge between people with wisdom. And you have the case of the two prostitutes, right? They both have sons, they both give birth to sons very close together, and one of them lies on her son at night and kills him. But she has the scheme where she's gonna take her dead son and replace do a switch and put take her friend's, you know, living son and act like it was the other woman who killed her son in the night. She, she lies, she takes the son, and the case is brought to Solomon. They say, which, they said, both of these women claim that the living child is theirs. How can I know? I mean, this is what happens in 1 Kings 3, 23 to 28. It says, then the king said, King Solomon, this one says, this is my son who is living, and your son is dead. And the other one says, no, for your son is the dead one. My son is the living one. And the king said, Get me a sword. So they brought the sword before the king. The king said, divide the living child in two and give half of the one to the one and give half to the other. 
Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, for she was deeply stirred over her son and said, Oh, my Lord, give her, to the, give her the living child and by no means kill him. But the other said, and I hear this, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is the mother. And all Israel was impressed by his wisdom. Notice that, though. You see that he... he, he thinks of a way, in a wise way, to, to figure out who's really telling the truth or the one who really cares about her son. But the other woman, you already see some of her wickedness already before this even comes to Solomon. But her envy over, her jealousy over the other woman's living child leads her to all sorts of other sins. She, she goes as far as, if I can't have the child, nobody can. Let's kill the child. I'm going to lie. All this stuff. She's lying. She's willing to kill a baby. Because of her jealousy, because of her envy, right? It's an insane amount of jealousy that leads, leads to all sorts of evil things. Again, just as James says. Those are some examples of jealousy in scripture that, that have led to all sorts of other sins that compile because of it. What about some examples of selfish ambition or selfishness? Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 1 about while he's in prison, there are preachers who are preaching, and there are preachers with two different motives, one with good motives and other preachers with selfish motives. Here this Philippians 1, 12 to 18. He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. He's saying, this is great. The gospel is still going forward, even though I'm in prison, even more so. He says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife. But, all, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, those from goodwill. Knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, those envious ones causing strife, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So even, this is, this is quite astonishing, what sinful hearts can do. Talk about selfish motivations. You know, some, some preach with pure motives, right, to glorify God for the salvation of people. Some were preaching the gospel to jab at Paul, to get ahead of Paul. Well, Paul's in prison. He can be out here preaching. Let me gain more influence with people in the world. Let me do something to get more praise. Amazing that we can take stuff that, look how good it looks. I mean, evangelism. Amazing, awesome, good things serving the Lord and have these evil motivations, these selfish motivations behind them. Right? These people are preaching Christ for themselves. Amazing what sinful hearts can do with things that look really good on the outside but are motivated by evil selfishness. That is a, that's really a, a, a fruit of this ungodly wisdom that James is telling us. We can take something as righteous as evangelism and do it with sinful motivation. So we need to ask ourselves, you need to ask yourself, what are things that I do that are motivated by selfishness yet look really good. They'll look good on the outside, but I do it with impure motives. I do it with a, a selfish ambition to get ahead, to look good. You have to think about that one this week. What do I do with selfish motives? So James tells us here, jealousy and selfish ambition are the roots of all sorts of disorder and every evil thing. Verse 16 he says that. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. We've seen some of that just with a, a short um, few citations from, from Scripture where these things are present. If jealousy and selfish ambition reside in your heart, <clears throat> they're going to come out as wicked words and wicked actions. That's what he's saying. All sorts of bad things come out of it. We see that. And the reason for that is that jealousy and selfish ambition are idolatry of you, of yourself. They're idolatry of self. You love yourself more than God if you're jealous and selfish. You care more about yourself than God's commands. You care more about yourself than others. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you say, no, I'm loving myself more. I want to love myself, right? I'm selfish. I want to get ahead of others. I want to put others down so I can get ahead. Jealous, envy. 
Jealousy and selfishness are both covetousness, the tenth commandment. But you know what else? Covetousness is also idolatry. Right? Ephesians 5 5 says, For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Covetousness is idolatry. And idolatry and covetousness lead to all sorts of other sins. All other sins are really rooted in idolatry, aren't they? And in covetousness. So there's no surprise here that jealousy and selfish ambition lead to all sorts of other sins because they're idolatry, they're covetousness. What are some examples of sins that might result from jealousy and selfishness? This disorder and every evil thing that James speaks of here. Here are just some examples that came to mind from the book of Proverbs to start with. Call this first one, scorching lives and weaselly cover-ups. This can be a thing that happens because of jealousy. Proverbs 26, 18 and 19. What an amazing proverb. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, was I not joking? See, jealousy can lead us to try to take down the person we're jealous of. Right, really cut them down a notch. Right, we want to throw out lies against them to to hurt their reputation because we're jealous of them. We want to be better than them. We're we're angry that they have the esteem that they have with people. We want to do damage to their relationships and reputations. Get in there and cause problems. Get in there and cause strife when you're jealous of somebody. And then when you're called to account and they say, "Hey, what are you doing? You're causing all sorts of problems." You say, "Hey, I was just kidding. Just a joke. Can't you take a joke, man?" Right, what a weaselly cover-up that is. Jealousy leads you to all sorts of evil things, and you say, well, I was just joking. The Bible compares you to an insane person. You hear that? Like a madman. You're insane if you do that. A firebrand, that's, that's a stick that's burning in a fire. You pull it out. It's a stick that's like on fire. So you're somebody who's walking around throwing burning sticks and arrows and death. People are getting hurt. People say, hey, what are you doing? You're hurting people. You say, hey, I was just kidding. Didn't mean any harm. Hey, what are you kidding? You're a madman. You're throwing out weapons, but you didn't mean any harm. That's what it's like when you're jealous and you go and try to hurt somebody. You say, well, I was just kidding. It's a weaselly cover-up, right? It actually hurts, and you know it, right? So jealousy can lead to disorder, like that causing strife and every evil thing. It's a very dangerous sin. Jealousy and selfishness can also lead to a similar sin, gossip and the strife that comes from it. <clears throat> Proverbs 26, 20 and 22 it says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out and where there is no whisperer, contention quiet down, quiets down like charcoal to hot embers and wood for fire. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. This is very similar to the liar who spreads false reports and then covers it up by saying, I'm joking. But here we have somebody who spreads dirt on people, who's a whisperer, they're called. And whisperers cause strife. Take away the wood, you take what, it makes the fire go down, take away the whisperer, it quiets down the strife, the contention. This is spreading dirt on people even when it's true. Not lying about them necessarily. You just want to spread about people's sins. You're not loving them and covering a multitude of sins. When you're jealous of somebody, you want to take them down. You find some dirt on somebody, let's spread that one around, right? Let's throw that one around. Let's cause some problems here. You know what's real sad about it? It says that gossip, the words of a whisperer, are like dainty morsels. They're like hors d'oeuvres. People walk around with a platter of hors d'oeuvres. Oh, yeah, I'll take some of that. That sounds good. You just keep swallowing them down. We like gossip, don't we? That's, That's a whole other sermon. But the point is that people want to hear that. So we like to give it out. Like, especially if somebody that we're jealous of, we're going to take them down, spread it around, and people will gobble it up like hors d'oeuvres. Jealous people don't want to cover other people's sins that they're jealous of, like love tells us to. They want to spread them around, cause strife, be a whisperer. Right? That's one, another sin that jealousy compounds into is causing strife like that. God, one of the things that God says he hates in Proverbs 6 is one who spreads strife among brothers. Right? And jealousy can make us want to spread strife among brothers. And of course, jealousy and selfish ambition can lead to murder, as we can see. We saw that with King Saul and David as he attempts to murder David. We also see it with who? Cain and Abel, right? Genesis 4, 3, and 5 says, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. 
So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. That jealousy led to the first murder. So when James says that jealousy and selfishness lead to disorder and every evil thing, he isn't kidding. It's something that really does. This ungodly wisdom that can reside in our hearts, it's not just a thing that stays put in one little area. It spreads like wildfire. Jealousy and selfish ambition lead to all sorts of evil things. So that's the second point is the ungodliness of that sort of wisdom. But then James tells us here in our third and final point what true godly wisdom looks like. And that's verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What is godly wisdom? He tells us a good list of things. Godly wisdom, then, of course, is not jealous and selfish. He says, first, pure. This is really a summary of what it is. It is pure. It is righteous. Proverbs 21 eight says, The way of the guilty man is crooked, but as for the pure, his conduct is upright. So if you're going to have this sort of wisdom from God, this wisdom from above, it's going to result in pure, righteous actions. It says the same even for children. Proverbs 20, verse 11 says, It is by his deeds that a lad distinguishes himself if his conduct is pure and right. Right? Wisdom, godly wisdom, will result in a pure conduct, a righteous and godly conduct. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is first pure. We're going to be pure in our actions as well as our words. Proverbs 15, 26 says, Evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant or gracious words are pure. Wisdom that comes from God makes us speak pure words, gracious words towards others. Someone with true wisdom doesn't have evil plans, evil desires in his heart. He thinks graciously of others and he speaks graciously of others. He has a heart that's filled with a desire to glorify God by obedience, a pure righteousness, a desire for holiness. Wisdom then is first pure, he says. Wisdom is first pure, it's righteous, it's holy. Secondly, wisdom is peaceable or peaceful. You could render that. The book of Proverbs tells us the same thing, that the ways of wisdom are the ways of peace. It says in Proverbs 3, 1 to 4, he says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. He also says in Proverbs 3 later on, it says about wisdom, her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. That's Proverbs three seventeen. The ways of wisdom, are those, those who are wise are going to be peaceful. They're going to be peacemakers, ones who endeavor for peace. Proverbs sixteen seven says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. A wise person makes peace. True wisdom brings peace with others. A wise person seeks peace. Peace, doesn't he? Psalm 34, 14 says that exactly. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You have to be peacemakers, one who endeavor for peace with others. Wise people make peace. They strive for peace. In Matthew 5, Jesus told us to exactly do it, to be people who seek peace. He says in Matthew 5, 23 and 24 in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. You see, even reconciliation and peacemaking even takes precedence and priority to to offering worship to God in that case. God wants you to go first make peace, then come and worship. That's quite an amazing thing. Wise people make peace then. They're peaceful. They're peaceable. Next, he says, wisdom is gentle. Wisdom is gentle. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And fifteen four, a soothing tongue or a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. As we've already seen, wise people are gentle people. They're not harsh. There's a, the wisdom, a gentleness of wisdom there. We're gentle towards others. We speak tenderly. We have sensitivity towards others. We, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, we speak the truth in love. You know, it's not enough to simply speak the truth. That's, that's not all God requires of you with your mouth. Do you know that? 
It's not just, well, at least I'm, it's, it's true after all, right? Yes, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth with gentleness, not with harshness, but the wisdom of gentleness in a gentle and a winsome way, a way that desires to build up people, not simply to tear them down, right? So wisdom is gentle. Next, it says wisdom is reasonable. What an, what an important one. Reasonable, persuadable, willing to yield. You are willing to change your mind. That's what wisdom is. You're reasonable. You're not stubborn. Proverbs twelve fifteen: the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Do you listen to advice? Do you want advice? Or I already know, I already know what I'm doing is right, you think, so I don't need any advice. No, a wise person is reasonable. They'll listen. Proverbs 10, 8, a, the wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will be ruined. Will you take instruction from people? Will you learn? Are you reasonable? Proverbs 17, 10, a rebuke goes deeper into the one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Are you able to be taught and change easily? Do you have to be beat and beat and beat and beat and beat and then you still won't change? Are you that stubborn, that unreasonable? You see, if you're not willing to listen to others, their point of view, if you're not willing to change your mind about anything, if you're accustomed to saying things like, I don't need to hear what you have to say. I already know what you're going to say. I don't need to hear it. If you act in such a way that you really don't think that you can be wrong about any of your opinions, then James says you're not wise. You're not having the wisdom from above. You're not reasonable. The Proverbs say the same thing. A wise man is he who listens to advice. He's able to be persuaded on things. He's, able to, he's willing to yield to others when it's, when it's necessary. A wise man receives commands. He receives rebukes. Unwillingness to listen to others, unwillingness to change are signs of ungodly foolishness, not the wisdom that comes from above. So, so wisdom from above is reasonable. We're told next it's full of mercy, full of mercy. Proverbs eleven seventeen: the merciful man does himself good, but the cruel man does himself harm. That word for merciful man is the word hesed in Hebrew, which is, there's really no agreed upon English way to translate that. Um, it's used of God a number of times, his loving kindness, his covenant faithfulness, his mercy, his covenant love, his loyalty, things like that. So if you, you have to have that sort of um, characteristic. You're a merciful man, a loyal man, a loving man, a covenantly, covenantally faithful person, a merciful person. True wisdom brings forth this sort of attitude towards others, a merciful, kind, loving attitude that mimics God in that way. But if you're cruel, this says, you harm yourself. You inflict pain and suffering on others and really on yourself when you're cruel. Wisdom that is earthly and spiritual and demonic is cruel. It's not merciful. Proverbs 12.10 says that, that unrighteous people are, are unmerciful even to animals. A righteous man has regard for the life of his animal, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Right? We need to be characterized by mercy, by love and things like that. A, a truly wise person shows mercy in all of his ways of life, even, even to his animals. You know, that's, that's the person that characterizes wisdom in his life. They show mercy. They're not cruel. We're told as well, and James, mercy is full of mercy and it's also full of good fruits. It can be translated full of fruits of goodness. Right? This is a broad summary statement of the kind of things that true wisdom brings forth. Good fruits. Full of good fruits. We saw in verse 16 that ungodly wisdom brings disorder and what? Every evil thing. Well, godly wisdom brings forth every good thing. It brings forth good fruits while ungodly wisdom brings forth every evil fruit. And we're told as well, it's unwavering. And the NASB could, could be translated better. It's more impartial or non-judgmental or non-prejudicial. That is... A better way of translating that, other translations will reflect that. Wisdom is impartial. And what's certainly in James's mind is what he had already instructed them earlier, which is don't commit the sin of partiality, right? He's saying be impartial. We saw that in James chapter 2. He says this, read this extended part, but it's important that we get this. He says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus with an attitude of personal favoritism. 
because wisdom is impartial. He says, for, a man, for if a man comes to your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in the good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down on my footstool, you have made distinctions. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? He says, listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you to court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name of which you've been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. See what he's doing there? Saying, if, you're, if you are committing the sin of partiality, showing this personal favoritism, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. Saying, if you're making judgments based upon superficial and empty criteria, like whether you're dressed nicely or whether you're dressed in dirty clothes, he says, that, that's ungodly. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. That's not being impartial. See, the thing is, the rich, in fact, are not more important than the poor, he's saying. He, you know, to apply, p- people of certain ethnic groups are not more important than other people of, ethnic, of different ethnic groups. That there's no partiality with God. There should be no partiality with us. Now, personally, in doing evangelism, you know, I talk to people on the street. And I've heard from a number of different people complaints that when they have attended churches, they were treated poorly because they were poor. They were treated badly because they weren't dressed very nicely. Because the people were, in fact, poor. James has words for such churches who treat people that way. I certainly hope that wouldn't be true of us here. The gospel and the kingdom of God is not simply for you know, the middle class and up or wherever you want to draw that line. It's for people of every status, every nation, every language, every culture. But if someone doesn't fit into our culture, if they were to come here, how would we treat them? How would we think of them? Would we make prejudicial assumptions right, about them? Would we prejudge them, in other words, right? Make these, these assumptions. When we say, well, he's poor. He's only looking to be a leech on the church or to take advantage of us. That's an ungodly judgment, an assumption. Or do we have the wisdom to be impartial, non-prejudicial, like James says here? It's impartial. Not to send a partiality where we judge on these empty, superficial criteria. And finally, he says, wisdom is without hypocrisy. This is so important. And this sums up quite a bit here. True wisdom is not a pretend wisdom. It's a genuine one. One that will prove itself by good works. Listen to these two Proverbs. These are some of my favorite Proverbs. Proverbs 26, verse 7. Like the legs which are useless to the lame, so is a proverb in the mouth of fools. In 26, 9. Like a thorn which falls into the hand of a drunkard, So is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Did you know that you can know all of this stuff about wisdom? You can memorize the whole book of Proverbs, have it all in your head, and still be a fool? Isn't that amazing? You can know all of this stuff and still be foolish. Fools hear all of this stuff about wisdom. They can talk about wisdom, right? The Proverbs are in their mouth, right? They can talk about it, but it doesn't affect them. It doesn't change them. It's like a man with lame legs. They're useless. They can't, do, they can't make him walk. Well, a proverb in your mouth, but it doesn't actually affect your life, it's useless. Having it in your heart, in your mind, in your, in your, even on your lips, but it doesn't change your life, it's useless. It's like a thorn that goes up into a hand of a drunkard, right? A drunk guy gets his hand pricked with a thorn, doesn't even feel it. Doesn't change him at all. It's like a proverb gets into your head, but it doesn't affect you. You can talk about it, it doesn't change you. It doesn't hurt you. The proverb should hurt you. They should convict you, get you to change, get you to move. You get your hand on the thorn, you should move. But a drunk doesn't move. He gets his hand on all these thorns, doesn't affect him at all. That's like somebody who hears the Proverbs but doesn't do them, who hears wisdom but doesn't do it. And James says, prove it. He says, don't be a hypocrite who says, yeah, I'm wise. Who is wise in understanding? I'm wise. I know the Proverbs, I know wisdom, but it doesn't actually get out in your life, right? You're not applying it to yourself, it's just applied to others. True wisdom is shown by right actions and words. Hypocrites claim to be wise, but act as fools. True wisdom is without hypocrisy. It's genuine. 
in our text, right? James 3, 13 and 14, he says, who among you is wise and understanding? He asked that question. He says what? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. That phrase, we didn't cover it before. I want to come back to it here. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. He asks, who, are, who among you is wise? He says, show up by your works. Don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. When you answer that question, am I wise in understanding? Don't judge yourself arrogantly. That is, thinking highly of yourself, making excuses for yourself, lying against what's actually true about you, that you're not wise in understanding. But you still have this selfishness, this jealousy, this ungodly wisdom in you. Don't say, well, I'm wise, but your actions betray you. Don't be arrogant and say, well, yeah, I have wisdom. But then look at your life. It's full of jealousy and selfish ambition and every disorder and evil thing. Proverbs 16.2 says, all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. See, we can't say, well, I'm wise. He says, don't just say you're wise. Show it by your works. Saying, don't be self-deceived. Examine what you're doing, what you're saying. Does it exhibit the wisdom that comes from God? All these things that are just listed there. Does it exhibit that? Or is it, that, is it the so-called wisdom that's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic? Does, does your life really more exhibit some of that? That's the real question here. It's not a matter of, well, I say I'm wise, I think I'm wise, and all that. Show it. And that'll, it'll, your wisdom, if you have it, will be proven by the way you live. In verse 18, James 3.18, he says, And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In other words, peacemakers will sow righteousness in peace and they'll harvest righteousness, right? People who make peace. True wisdom, then, is characterized by all those righteous things we just saw. It's pure and peaceable, gentle, reasonable, etc. It's characterized by this righteousness, and we sow that in peace, and we reap that righteousness in our lives. If we're going to have wisdom, it's going to change us. It's going to affect us. It's not going to be like a thorn going up into our hand. It doesn't change us. We're not going to be somebody who looks in the mirror but then forgets. True wisdom resides in our hearts and changes us, and it's shown by our actions, shown by the way that we, how we live, how we act, and what we say, how we speak with others. True wisdom is characterized by all those righteous things that are listed in the previous verse, and all these things are characterized by those who are peacemakers, those who make peace, those who love peace are peacemakers. As verse 17 says, wisdom is peaceable. He's emphasizing that again. It produces the fruits of righteous living, this sort of wisdom, this sort of peace, which is contrasted with this ungodly wisdom, which produces disorder. See, godly wisdom produces peace and righteousness. Ungodly wisdom, what? Produces disorder and every evil thing. They're opposites. They're put in direct contrast. Ungodly wisdom produces disorder and evil. Godly wisdom produces peace, not disorder, and righteousness. So we need to be people who are exhibiting that, that's producing righteousness by the real wisdom that we have in our hearts. In conclusion, I want to uh, look at one more passage. I want you to turn with me here. This will be the last passage to look at. Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. What we have in the section in James we just looked at is similar to what we have in Proverbs chapter 9 because we have a contrast here. In James 3, we have a contrast of godly wisdom with ungodly so-called wisdom, which is really foolishness, isn't it? This sort of wickedness. In James, we have the same, th- or in Proverbs 9, I mean, we have the same things. A contrast between true wisdom and folly or foolishness. I want to read this chapter, these 18 verses, and I want do you notice a couple things about it that I'll point out? Proverbs chapter 9, the contrast of wisdom and folly. Wisdom has built her house. She has honed out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Is what she says. Whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. To him who lacks understanding, she says... Come, eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself, and he who reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. 
Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase his learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and the years of your life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. That's wisdom. Now here's foolishness or folly. Verse 13. The woman of folly is boisterous. She is, she is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house on the seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by who are making their paths straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So much in there, and we won't unpack all of that, of course. But I do want you to notice just one thing about this. The calls that wisdom and folly make. Verse 4, wisdom calls, whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. To him who lacks understanding, she says. And folly says in verse 16, whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks understanding, she says. I want you to notice that. What foolishness will mimic wisdom. False wisdom will mimic true wisdom. Say, come in here. You're simple. You need wisdom. Come in here. But it's actually foolishness. When you look at James here, he says, it's not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's a wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. You can mistake it for wisdom with your sinful hearts and things like that. You can, you can look at it and say, this actually seems like the right way to go. I'm going to trust my own heart, right? That, that person really doesn't deserve what they have, and you can justify your jealousy and your selfishness. I do deserve this, et cetera, et cetera. He says, don't, don't listen to that sort of fault, fool yet. Foolishness, or sorry, foolishness, folly, excuse me. But listen to true wisdom that comes from God. He said, you'll know the difference. When disorder and every evil thing flow from what you do, you know that you're not having the right type of real wisdom. You're having false wisdom. But when there's purity in your life, peacefulness, gentleness, you're being reasonable, you're full of mercy and good fruits, you're impartial and without hypocrisy, that's how you'll know. You will know wisdom by fruits. True wisdom will produce righteousness. Demonic wisdom will produce sin. That's the main point here. So we have to ask, I have to ask, as James asks, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we do confess that we're not wise in many ways, because we're so sinful. We do still have so much of this foolishness bound up in our hearts, this ungodly wisdom, this earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom, this self-centeredness that we have, this envious, covetousness, idolatry. We do pray that you'll root that out. Give us wisdom. We're so thankful that you've promised to us that if we ask for wisdom. You won't upbraid us. You won't rebuke us. If we ask in faith, you will give wisdom. You promise in James. We thank you. We pray that you will. We also thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who died for fools like us. We thank you that despite all of our foolish ungodliness, you've loved us and sent your son to save us. We do pray that you'll help us to live lives more pleasing to you, to sow seeds of righteousness and reap harvests of righteousness as, as this says to sow in peace that we pray that you will put into our hearts this genuine wisdom from you that comes from you that every good gift comes from you and we know that only you can give it to us help us to seek it out in your word and to apply it to our lives make us a wise people we thank you for your grace towards us and your forgiveness we pray this for Christ's sake Amen.